Ever feel like you need a decoder ring for all the data thrown at you? Today, we're your guides, diving deep into the world of behavioral measurement and why trusting your data is way more exciting than it sounds. We're cracking open this fascinating chapter from a behavioral science textbook. And honestly, it's more relatable than you might think. Imagine this. You're settling a friendly argument. Three buddies, John, Tim, and Bill, just finished a bike ride. John's bike computer boasts a solid 68 miles. Uh -huh. Tim shows a respectable 67.5. And Bill, well, he's just dragging himself home, claiming a leg burning 100 miles. Okay, I'm already hooked. Who do we trust? This feels like a data mystery. It is. And to solve it, we need to understand what makes good data, well, good. And are the three pillars of trustworthy measurement, validity, accuracy, and reliability. These are our trusty tools for sifting through the data dust and finding the real story. Okay, let's break those down. Validity... I feel like that's checking if we're even measuring the right thing in the first place. Like, Bill's sore muscles might tell us something, but it's probably not an accurate measure of actual miles biked. You nailed it. Mm -hmm. Validity is all about making sure your data lines up with what you actually want to measure. Bill's using his aching quads as a gauge for distance, an indirect and likely invalid measure. If you wanted to know how far they rode, he should have used an odometer like John and Tim. Think of it like this. If you're measuring happiness, you wouldn't just count smiles. Right. Right. You want to look at other factors, too, how often people laugh or share positive emotions. So validity is about making sure you're not accidentally measuring apples when you really want oranges. But even if we're measuring the right thing, couldn't the number still be off? That's where accuracy comes in, right? Exactly. Accuracy is all about how close your measurement is to the true value. Let's say their friend Lee drove the same route with a super accurate calibrated odometer and it clocked in at 58 miles. Suddenly, all three friends' measurements are looking a little shaky. Mm. Even if they were internally consistent, they were all inaccurate to some degree. Wow, so even if you're consistently getting the same result, doesn't mean you're hitting the bullseye. You could be reliably wrong. Which brings us to the last member of our data trust trio, reliability. So is reliability all about getting the same results over and over, even if those results are a bit, well, off? Precisely. Think back to John's bike computer. It, it consistently shows 68 miles. Yeah. It's very reliable, even if we know from Lee's odometer that it's not accurate. Got it's it. like a friend who's always 10 minutes late, reliable in their lateness, but not accurate to the actual meeting time. Okay, this is already making me look at all data differently. So we've got these three pillars. Validity, are we measuring the right thing? Accuracy, are we measuring it correctly? And reliability, are we getting consistent results? But it feels like some are definitely more important than others. Like, what good is reliable, inaccurate data if it's not even measuring what you intended in the first place? You hit the nail on the head. There's a hierarchy here. Validity reigns supreme. It doesn't matter how accurate or reliable your data is. If it's not measuring what you intended, it'd be like meticulously tracking the number of leaves falling from a tree to understand climate change. Yeah. You're getting consistent, maybe even accurate data, but it's not reflecting the phenomenon you're actually interested in. It's like building a house on a shaky foundation. Yep. You need that solid base validity before you even think about putting up walls, accuracy, and a roof, reliability. A perfect analogy. And just like with a house, there are a lot of things that can threaten the structural integrity of your data, those sneaky pitfalls that can send your measurements off kilter. Ooh, data dangers. This deep dive just got real. Tell me more about these data obstacles we need to watch out for. All right, so we've got our blueprints for trustworthy data, validity, accuracy, reliability, but it's it sounds like there are a lot of ways things can go wrong. What are some of those sneaky data pitfalls we need to watch out for? Well, you've got to be careful not to fall into common traps like indirect measurement. Okay. Remember Bill trying to use his sore muscles to measure mileage? Right. That's indirect. It's like using standardized tests to measure actual learning. They can give you some clues, but they're not directly measuring what's happening in the classroom. Uh, so it's like judging a chef's skills based solely on their Instagram photos. Right. They might stage those plates beautifully, but you won't know how their food actually tastes without a real bite. So how do we avoid falling to that indirect measurement trap? It boils down to being crystal clear about what you want to measure. If you're interested in a student's understanding of a concept, Asking them to explain it in their own words during class would be a far more direct measure than their performance on a multiple choice test. In fields like applied behavior analysis, direct measurement is key. You want to observe the behavior itself, not just a proxy or a side effect. Direct measurement, got it. 
Makes sense. So what else can throw off our data's GPS and send us heading in the wrong direction? Another common pitfall is measuring the wrong dimension of a behavior. Imagine dipping a ruler into a pot of boiling water. Okay. You might get super precise measurements of the water's depth, but that tells you absolutely nothing about its temperature. Right. You've got the wrong tool for the job. Okay, that's a recipe for disaster, especially if you're aiming for a perfectly cooked pasta dish. So how do you make sure you're measuring the right dimension, the one that truly matters? It all goes back to your research question. What do you ultimately want to understand? If you're looking at, say, the effectiveness of a new teaching method on student engagement, you wouldn't just measure how many times a student raises their hand. Right, right. You'd also want to consider things like their body language, their contributions to class discussions, even their facial expressions. Ah, so you're capturing the multifaceted nature of engagement, not just one narrow aspect. It's like the difference between counting the instruments in an orchestra and actually listening to the symphony. Precisely. You need to consider the full picture. Now, on top of indirect measurement and measuring the wrong dimension, You've also got to watch out for what we call measurement artifacts. Oh, These are like mirages in the data desert, misleading results that crop up because of how the data was collected. Ooh, these measurement artifacts sound sneaky, like those optical illusions where your brain takes a shortcut and shows you something that isn't actually there. A very apt comparison. Yeah. And one of the biggest culprits is discontinuous measurement. Ideally, when observing behavior, you want to capture every single instance continuously, like recording a movie. Right. But let's face it, that's not always feasible. Sometimes you have to rely on snapshots, observing only at certain intervals. Right. But depending on how those intervals are chosen, you might end up with a distorted view, kind of like judging a song based on hearing only a few seconds of it every minute. Oh, I've totally done that. Scrolling through song previews online, you can totally miss the best part. So is there like a real world example of how this discontinuous measurement can really skew the results? There's a classic study where researchers looked at different ways of scheduling observations in a preschool classroom. They found that certain time sampling methods made the data look way more variable than it actually was compared to continuous measurement. It's like trying to judge the traffic on a busy highway by only looking out the window for a few seconds every hour. You might catch a lull when it's actually super congested most of the time. So the way you structure your observation periods can really color your perception of what's actually happening. That's wild. It highlights how crucial it is to understand the potential pitfalls of discontinuous measurement. Okay. You've got to be mindful of how your observation method might be influencing the data you're collecting. This is making me realize how many factors are at play. It's like we're detectives looking for clues, but we have to be super careful not to contaminate the crime scene. Are there other ways our data can get uh, muddled up? Okay, we've covered sneaky measurement traps and those pesky artifacts, but isn't there another layer to this? Even with the best laid plans, we're the humans collecting the data. I've been known to misplace my keys, forget appointments. How can we be sure we're not introducing errors into the equation? You've hit on another crucial factor, human error. Even with the best intentions, we can impact the accuracy and reliability of our measurements. Right. One major culprit. Poorly designed systems. Okay. If a system's overly complicated, observers are more likely to make mistakes. It's like... <laughs> Too many moving parts. It's like trying to juggle chainsaws while riding a unicycle. Something's bound to go wrong. Exactly. Simplicity is key for a system that minimizes those whoops moments. Mm -hmm. But even with a streamlined setup, inadequate observer training can throw a wrench in the works. You can't just hand someone a stopwatch and a data sheet and expect, like... Olympic level data collection. Right. There's an art to it. Like my idea of paying attention while watching a movie usually involves snacks and side conversations. Right. I wouldn't trust myself to observe a scientific study. That's why rigorous training is so essential. Observers need practice, real world examples, and crystal clear criteria for what good looks like. I... There was a study where um, observers had to learn to measure the completion of maintenance tasks, and they weren't considered competent until they hit 90% agreement with the true values three sessions in a row. Wow. Talk about high standards. That's dedication. It's not just knowing the rules. It's about applying them consistently, like a data-driven ninja. But what if someone starts strong, then their focus uh, drifts? Ah, you've just identified another sneaky pitfall. Observer drift. We can unconsciously change our interpretations over time without even realizing it. Okay. Imagine an observer tracking a child's behavior. What they initially coded as disruptive 
might gradually shift as they become familiar with the child's personality. So it's like your measuring stick is slowly warping without you knowing? That's a bit unnerving. How do we catch that before our data goes haywire? Regular check-ins and ongoing feedback are key. It's like calibrating your instruments, making sure everyone's still on the same page and using the same standards. Like a data tune-up. Okay, we've got training and tune-ups to combat drift, but what about our own biases? Can those sneak into the data too? Absolutely. Observer expectations can be a powerful, often unintentional influence. If an observer expects a certain outcome, they might subtly bias their observations to align with that expectation. Subconsciously nudging the data in their preferred direction. It's like a data-driven, self-fulfilling prophecy. How do we avoid that? Blindfold the observers. Not quite a blindfold, but close. Using what we call naive observers, those who are clueless about the study's hypotheses or expected outcomes can help minimize this type of bias. Ah, oh, fresh eyes. It's like that feeling when you get a second opinion from someone who's not already caught up in the details. It makes perfect sense. Okay, anything else we need to watch out for on our quest for pristine data? Well, there's one more sneaky way we can mess things up. Observer reactivity. Okay. It turns out the mere act of observing can change the behavior we're trying to measure. Oh, right. Like when you catch someone staring at you and you instantly change your posture or adjust your hair, it's human nature. Exactly. And just like that, even the most well-intentioned observer can become an unintentional variable in their own study. So it's that we need to become invisible data ninjas, observing without being detected. Are there any invisibility cloaks in the data world? Not quite but we can get creative. Strategies like physically separating observers, using recordings, or even just having observers pop in at unpredictable times can all help minimize reactivity. Data camouflage tactics. Okay, this has been a whirlwind tour of all the ways measurement can go wrong, from sneaky traps to our own human fallibility. It feels empowering to know what to look for. But how do we, as data consumers, make sure the information we're swimming in is actually trustworthy? Give us the cheat codes. There are definitely ways to check your data's pulse. One powerful technique is accuracy assessment. Okay. It's the gold standard. Comparing your data to a known true value. Think of it like checking your answers against the answer key. So if I'm checking the accuracy of like a spelling test, I'd compare the grader's results to a dictionary. Exactly. Or imagine a culinary school quiz about which ingredients thicken sauces. You'd compare the student's answers to the instructor's lesson plan, which would be the true value in that context. Makes sense. But what if you can't get a true value for something? It's not always as clear cut as a dictionary definition. You're right. When a true value is elusive, reliability assessment is your next best bet. It won't guarantee accuracy, but it can highlight potential inconsistencies or red flags. So if you're evaluating something like student essays, which can be a bit subjective, you might have another person score the same essay to see if their assessments line up. Exactly. You're looking for consistency, a sign that the measurement system is being applied reliably. And then there's inter-observer agreement, or IOA, a cornerstone in fields like applied behavior analysis. Oh, I've heard of that. It's like the data buddy system, yeah. right? Yeah, you have multiple observers independently measure the same thing. If their results match up, it boosts your confidence in the data. It's like that saying, two heads are better than one, but for data analysis. I like it. So it doesn't guarantee accuracy, but it does provide a stronger foundation for your findings. It's like having multiple witnesses to confirm a story, the more the merrier. This deep dive has been an eye-opening journey into the world of behavioral measurement. We've gone from those essential ingredients of trustworthy data to all the potential pitfalls, and even learned how to spot a data dud. Well said. And in today's data-saturated world, being a discerning data consumer is more critical than ever. By understanding the principles of validity, accuracy, and reliability, and by recognizing the ways measurement can be compromised, you're well equipped to ask the right questions and determine for yourself if the behavioral data you encounter is truly solid. Data literacy for the win. So next time you come across a statistic or research finding, remember our biking buddies, John, Tim, and Bill. Don't just accept numbers at face value, dive a little deeper, ask questions, and consider the source. You might be surprised by the fascinating insights you uncover along the way.